Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that she is saying that this is very nice, but you know, <laughs> she also, when one is writing, one wants to, yeah. Um, I mean, a little bit my biography was I studied at the film school in Berlin and this was not in particular a place where you go out and leave and make experimental films. So the film school at that time was a very open-minded school. That means uh, we could do what we want. There were no professors, we could also bring people in. So I brought in the filmmaker um, Elfi Mikesh, camera and person and filmmaker. And um, I was, I had seen the films like uh, early films from Ulrike Ottinger, which I find inspiring, her way of formalistic, not only content-wise, because they were the feminist movement, like Helke Sander, they were some more content-orientated, but also in the form free, freer uh, filmmakers. But Ulrike brought in an aesthetic, uh, different... Um, um, yeah, she was very self-confident in this and, and put the make a statement in the early films, especially, I like them. So, but in the film school, a film school is always a delicate, you know, institution because we are, we, we all thought in the end, after five years, that maybe we go out and we make art, art house movies or long documentaries. So, um, I had to find myself a little bit or, or, or go back. The crisis was after the film school. So what to do? What, which way do I want to go? And really actually to remember my beginning, to, to, to close the circle again. And because my very first film, Schweigend ins Gespräch vertieft, was very, uh, was just following my own um, intuitions, you can say, and, and not so much, was not so much uh, guided by rules or um, not only technical rules but also you know mental rules so uh, it took some time before i really thought which kind of film do i really want to do and then one key moment was again the uh, jonas Mika's film uh, at the berlinale in 86 at that time it was, uh, he stands in the desert counting the seconds of his life and I went in the, I, w I was following the Berlinale with my um, f uh, very close filmmaker friend Ulrike Pfeiffer. We had also worked together at the film school. We saw movies, we didn't like them and we saw his film and we were inspired and we thought we want to make a film immediately. So we took the Bolex camera from the film school back, we were already, had already finished and decided to make um, a three-minute roll, you know, in the Bolex, it's only three minutes, and edit in camera, and, and go to a place, decided the dresses, the place, and the way of how we want to film, and it worked out very well. And so that, that was a big confirmation, you know, and, and I thought that's um, how even the music worked with, the, with our kind of filmmaking, and so I was, um, that encouraged me. And then I decided I want to stay. I don't want to make art house films. I buy my own Bolex. I buy my own editing table. I want to be independent from this kind of market system. And so, yeah. And so I started uh, in the in the late eighties. And then I was I was going more in the idea of portraits and uh, collecting pieces. You know, also not this idea of you write a script and then you ask for money and then you produce it in two weeks or four weeks or whatever. So that allowed me also a different kind of filmmaking. I mean, as I said, it's uh, first it is the instrument itself, the camera itself. So, so I have my camera, I show it again, the Bolex. This is a good Bolex here. Um, and it is a very, um, it's a silent camera, so it's, it always means image and sound is divided. It's never at the same time, it's never possible to, to film at the same time and take the sound at the same time. One thing. The second is you have only three minute, three minute film material. So one roll is only capable of three minutes, you know. And so that means you, your decisions are different. You make different decisions when you are filming but also how, how you use it and how you film, you know, 
it's a, the tool itself, it's a little bit, I sometimes compare it with a musical instrument. You know this instrument very well. You know what to do, your fingers find the way. And you, I don't want to, to change it. That's, that's the first thing. You can say, I started with it and I stay with it. And um, of course it changed the possibilities mainly of showing 16 millimeter prints. So that becomes more and more difficult and becomes something um, special, you can say, you know, that um, if you have the event of a real 60 millimeter film projection and yeah, that's but but you have to think that the films I do they are not shown in in big places. Uh, anyway, a minority of people who will you know. This is the telephone, the digital telephone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, I always say there are, there are two kinds. There is one, I want to call it montage, more the classical, so which sequence comes after which sequence, and this is what I built more or less on the editing table. But there is the other one, like um, editing in camera, so while filming. While I'm filming, I create the rhythm, and by stopping and making breaks and structuring the film in the camera while filming. So, so this is a, um, there was this like jump cuts or, or I change positions. It's a little bit kaleidoscopic, you know, you, you don't look frontal on one, uh, your object or subject or whatever. And, but you, you, you discover it by, by, um, in a, in a more space, uh, um, environment, you know, I'm moving, I move, it's always handheld. I always have a handheld camera, so it is an extension of my physical also of the body and I will move around and um, so it, 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 it's creating fragments, little fragments and I call it sometimes kaleidoscopic because it is the, uh, when you put the fragments all together you, you become also a, a whole piece, you're creating a whole, but if you look in time it seems um, fragmentized and maybe not harmonious but if you think back in memory of the films sometimes it's successful sometimes of course it's not always working but I hope in the end in the memory like music when I memorize a piece which I don't know too well yeah then I have a kind of synthesis synesthetic experience and not this you know, one after the other. It's also how, how do we look at, at films? You know, usually in the, in the narrative or in documentaries also, we can say we read the film. So we really, we are following the story by looking and, and we, we, we try to understand everything. You know, we try to understand, aha, this is this, aha, this is that. You know, we go by, yeah, in a way of understanding, but but I what I like is sometimes that like in the train when you when you have a train ride and you look out of the window and things are flying, or if you look on a river, things are flying, are passing by. You cannot grab everything. Also in life, we cannot grab ev every second. You know, so it's the same. There's something is going, and you as a spectator, it's impossible to follow every image. You cannot read every image. It's not even you are quite capable, it will not work. So you have to let it a little bit, it is a space, you are here, there's a film going, like listening, you know, it is, it's coming together, it is it's a whole, it is not that we really literally go with every image. And, um, but this is how people, how we are not used to look, we are used to look like, aha, uh -huh, we understood, now it's going, now he's going out of the house, now he's going on the street, now he's, killing someone, now there is this car coming, you know? Yeah, you can, you can, by, I mean, as long as you film, you can say the reality, and this is still, I mean, there are filmmakers like Brackage who, who, who made the, 
who in the end was really literally scratching or, or, or painting on film. So really transfer the abstraction into the film. Or there are the people like uh, Sherrits or, or people who work just with Macopoulos with rhythm and a kind of abstraction. But this is not how I work. So as long as you work with the, with the reality, um, it's a kind of documentary. One can call it or observations. You know, it's a kind of uh, I'm observing, and it goes through me and back on the on the film. So it is a, there is a transformation, but I'm not. I mean, the book is still the book. The tree is still the tree. The tree. So I do feel like I've grown here at Mount Holyoke because I've learned how to discern what thoughts are unimportant to take emotionally. And because people were talking about, are women more emotional, are women more mm -hmm. logical? And I was thinking, since I've been here, I've actually been sort of thinking of thought as genderless. Um, as soon as I'm here, and it's pretty much homogenous in terms of gender, then I stopped thinking about gender, and I'm much right. happier with just being with myself. I don't have to de like necessarily right. talk to people. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I don't think of them as other women. I actually think of them as other people. I, I've actually erased the idea of gender, which is, I guess, ironic that I'm here. Yeah, I mean, I always liked the statement that the personal is political, and um, you know, it is. It, yeah, it was interesting because Maria Palacios, I think she said it. I don't know who wrote the quote, but I, Maria invited me last year to the Courtesan uh, Festival uh, as an artist in focus in Ghent, and uh, when she made the introduction, she said, uh, "In these dark times of Trump, and after Trump was elected, she thought oh, we need the films of, of Ute." And so, I mean, it was a big compliment for me in a way, because I don't say that we should change the world this or that way, you know. It's, it's just the, the, where do we, from what do we gain energy, from what do we gain our visions or our, our joy to, 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 to live, you know, and to continue. And, and, to in, and I think this, this food, which... Yeah, maybe other people, they are religious, they, you can pray, you can be a singer, you can, there are many, many, many ways. But, um, but for me, it's also very egoistically that, that also for myself, when I'm filming what I'm filming, you know, I'm myself feeding also. I'm not only feeding the audience, hopefully, in the end, but it's also a kind, um, yeah, when you, when you focus on these, what, what also we all share as humans, it is, we, we all share, it's, it's, I mean, whichever race or whichever culture or wherever you nation or whatever you want to say or religion you come from, we share basic things and I think maybe in this way it's political. Yeah. I think, you know, when you when you see some work of other filmmakers which would speak to you, it's it's very that's something mysterious because you 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 don't know in the moment what it is. You just you just felt like when you look at the painting and you think maybe you everybody knows that when we speak about painters. Oh yeah, I like Matisse. I know I'm a Picasso fan, or I'm you know it is very subjective. So. Also with the, with the filmmaking, same, you, you see something and suddenly it's speaking to you and you don't know why. First, you don't know why. It's just that something happens. And then later, um, 
maybe you understand, for instance, it was the Smikas, the same. I didn't know when I saw first the film of his, it was the Lithuania film. I didn't know him at all. I did have never heard the name, nothing. I was just there looking at this film and thought, this kind of film, well, one can make this kind of film. It was either a documentary, not a feature. It was not an experimental, how I saw before, like Michael Snow was called experimental. This was different. So it opened up something which I find, or you can say the third category, you know, that's also with the experimental always, I don't know if I'm an experimental filmmaker. So it is something in between and then you can call it, some people call it poetic or... Um, and then I saw the Menken the same. She was more playful, of course, and she stayed with a short form. Of course, Jonas Max always the big, long movies, you know. And uh, so she had this courage, no, I just make these little tiny... And I first saw Dwight Yana, it's an animation, which was just joyful. And then I saw The Notebook, which, were, which is the kind of collection of little sketches. It's only 10 minutes long and, and very tight, silent, nothing special. And I remember always one image in the very beginning. It's black and white and there's a little, I think it's a white duck or a swan. It's just going swimming on the edge of the frame, you know, swimming. And when I saw this, it was just, you can say, this image which opened my, my heart and I can't explain why, but I, I find it so great, this image, this duck or swan swimming there. So um, it's also, this is something I think where you are connected and, and then you are connected not only to the image, but the filmmaker behind the image or, or something when you feel similar, uh, there's some... I'm not alone, you know, I'm not alone. There's someone, someone else in the world who has this kind of uh, relation to the world and to, the, to life. And also Tate, uh, Madeleine, she mentioned, said, I think you will like her work, you know, the Scottish filmmaker Margaret Tate. So, um, and when I went to London for some yoga conference and I, w I went to Lux, at that point, it was the filmmakers' co-op, and they had the prints of her, and so I looked at them. Very lousy conditions, light, the editing table, almost I could hardly see. But also there, it's an example for it came through. You know, I thought, ah, oh, yeah, I. Her spirit speaks to me. I feel, I yeah, and it is all the three. I would say are not these kind of conceptual, intellectual. I mean, their radicalism there is somewhere else. It's not lying in breaking the form or, you know, this kind of avant-garde, I break it, I make something new. So, yeah, and then, uh, and also as a female filmmaker, it's nice to discover female filmmakers. Of course, see their lives. Tate, for instance, she, she, she all her about 30 films, short films, she made one long feature when she was 73 years old. She got no sub financial support for her films. She was a, trained as a doctor. She sometimes worked as a doctor also. So, um, but she kept on going, she kept on working, you know? She didn't give up. And even it was hard. Now, we, now she's, she passed away in 99. Now we have a Margaret Tate Award in Glasgow and things like this, but... So it's car, it's it gives it's uh, encouraging also mm -hmm. yeah sometimes it's by chance so i started with a i mean there is, there is, there are films in the 90s. These were just close friends. My sister, her partner, Dietl and Jon. Um, then Babel saw the film and liked it and said, don't you want to make one about me and Charlie? And I said, okay, let's try. We can work together. You know. And then my friend Maria. Um, so this was a series in the 90s when I made the portraits, but really close friends. And, um, and then... My second, uh, like Paulina, Franz, Susan, Lisbeth and uh, Maria, and now it is uh, Lisa. This was different. It, it just started with my um, godchild. 
she was here and visiting me and lying here on the sofa and sleeping and I thought with her breakfast for Tiffany book and I thought it looks, looks nice and I started filming and then I was thinking when I when I got back the, back the footage I thought I have other images of hers when she was younger so I was looking and then I constructed a little bit this kind of back and forth between her as a 12 year, 13 year old and when she was younger and it became a gift for her confirmation and then that that worked very well and then I thought ah I have another godchild <laughs> Franz and I looked into the footage I have and so then then it builds up and then I like the idea that that each one is a little you know maybe five minutes maximum five minute long film. I don't know what was first, but it, it, it came out, um, Maria and me, Maria also studied at the film school. She came one year later and we became close friends and um, she, we were asking who were the first women in, in Germany making films after the Second World War. So we, we looked into the history of uh, Ulm, uh, um, the Hochschule in Ulm, where Alexander Kluge studied, uh, t taught, taught. And they were the first film class, I think, in West Germany. I think they started in 63. And there were some like Ulla Stöckel and Claudia von Ahlemann, Janine Meerapfel, Recher Jungmann. And we looked into their work and we looked at what they did and we invited them partly also to the school, to the DFFB who helped, you know, who we, we founded a film club in the film school. And, um, and then we had the idea, okay, let's look at the film, uh, the students, the film school was founded in 66 and the film school was uh, famous or is famous for their political history because uh, in, in 68 people like Farocki were there, Harun Farocki were there and Hartmut B. Tomsky and so there was also a kind of, um, they changed by fighting for other conditions. They wanted the film school differently and they were successful for instance. they. No professors anymore at the film school. We have a, we had a, I don't know how you call it, one third of all the juries and gremien who are deciding were one third students with a full voice, you know, full. And so, um, and then we wanted to look which kind of films did the women do? What, what was going on? And then we started looking at the films and also we, we got some money, we applied for some money as a kind of research project and we, we sent them letters and we wanted different biographers. We thought we don't want this kind of born then, da, 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 but maybe a little bit more personal. So maybe they sent us photos or they are writing us a letter or whatever. So uh, this was really interesting to see what, how these biographies of the of these women uh, students developed. What did they do after film school? How many became f uh, filmmakers? And then, for me, it was very important to see that we usually we judge after how many films we have done. You know, like like materialistic things. And I call this the visible world. But all the invisible. And especially in the female biographies, of course, children is a very direct thing. You can say, okay, I have a child, but this is a human being and it gives its own life. You cannot say all your lifetime, it's my child, like it's my movie, you know. So I realized that, these, that, the, that the female work, that this invisible, often invisible work, I want, I want to call it work, or just the life is so important and you know in other cultures I, I jump now but it was interesting because on the Berlinale I saw a film from 1930 about this t Togo like the colony it was in, from a woman uh, nowadays you will maybe call it the anthropologist she was working in this village and and they made um, just filmed the daily life of the village and they were an introduction and there was a um, a man, maybe a professor, I don't know, 
who said to explain to the audiences, actually it was a nice idea really directly in introduction to tell us a little bit how these people live. And, and he said, these people, meaning maybe whole Africa, they have a completely different understanding of the world. They don't differ between visi the visible and the invisible world. For them, it's all one. You know, if you, if you think this stone is a god, they feed the god, they give food, later we see this. So this, this and, and then I thought, yeah, this is very interesting, you know, and, and I, I felt like this was my discovery during this work with the book, the invisible work of the female, which is completely different um, than we usually think what we, you know, what is useful, what, 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 we, what we have to produce. And, and so actually, this, this, it became a nice book. We only made uh, 25 uh, exemplare. So we have only 25 books because we really, we glue each photocopy in and so on. Yeah, so the side effect, you can say, of this book, I mean, by the way, it's a wonderful book for, for, for also information. You can go back and in the library, it is in, in the film school has it. But for me, it was also opening consciously again, thinking about the female, the positive. Because sometimes we are in danger, you know, we, we are always in competition, of course, with the males. And we also want to make big movies and we also want to be uh, in the world, you know. Yeah, the, no, this kind of, the movie was interesting, how he said it. And then also that I came back to my idea of the invisible, you know, this, because when we make films, we, I mean, you know, what you do when, or what, when we think, alone when we think and we have feelings, we know this is a force, you know, it's a force. You think, you have a feeling, it's a force. Yeah, so I, I, after the film school, I finished uh, in, in, in 85 and then was this uh, to find out what to do and where to go. And also I was in a kind of association for a long time, actually for 10 years. Um, one can call it a women alternative union or something. So every, uh, it was open to all uh, women who are working with film, wherever, TV, whatever, whatever. And this was an interesting model for some years. Um, I mean, we met each other in com and, and we were working completely different on completely different uh, <laughs> institutions or even, I mean, spiritual ideas. And when they celebrated the 10th anniversary, you know, we had an idea of, uh, we made a little video, which is actually funny. We had a sentence from Gertrude Stein wie mögen sie das, was sie haben? So, how do you like what you have? Maybe literally translated. And each of us made a little performance. And in the end, this was fun to do. And also, um, yeah, we showed it. And then in the end came out, it was nice, this working in a group. So how can we continue? And then we had the idea, we want to show once a month films from filmmakers who are in this Filmarbeiterinnen. Verband der Filmarbeiterinnen in this kind of union um, in the Arsenal. And we asked the, uh, Erika Gregor, the wife of uh, Ulrich and uh, co-founder of the Arsenal, and she liked the idea. And so we started. And actually it was Maria Lang, again Maria, uh, and me who started. And um, the only condition was we show only films by women. And then very quickly the other members were not so interested. And Maria went to her, left Berlin uh, to look after her mother, who, who became very old and couldn't live alone anymore. And so I continued alone and, um, yeah, and I, I, had to, I had to make researches, which kind of women, and I was reading. And so this is how I discovered also the Mencken or followed it more up and took it serious, you know. So here's my little collection, you know. It was every, every, I don't know if it's in the movie, but every month, more or less, for five years, um, a program. And then I stopped and thought, that's enough now. It, it of course, not, no money. Um, but then came the so-called 100 years of cinema year. And this 100 years of cinema, there was a list of the f 
women filmmakers 100 years of cinema and this list was exactly the same names like I have heard before and so I thought I have to find something else to 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 get more light into the history and so I had the idea I will ask a woman sometimes mainly they were also filmmakers themselves and they should um, cho choose a film of a female f of a woman filmmaker which was very important for them and so through this we 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 discovered a lot of films and it was also supported by something very nice in berlin we have an institution in the in the in the senate, senate for culture or something which is only supporting women uh, filmmakers and photographers and they supported this area of film thank you very much yeah thank you